scripture reading, we'll read uh, those, those several verses. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called into, uh, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now he that ascended, what is it, but, he, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some, pro, uh, and some pro, prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that we'd all be able to read the scriptures and just be able to grasp as we read through it how much importance is in every verse for us to stop and think about and to know and to stand in. And we pray today that in our study that we might uh, just be challenged uh, not only to know the things that will be taught, but then, Father, to be exhorted to uh, do exactly what the passage instructs us to do, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we pray for understanding and commitment on our part. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we started studying this last week. I thought that just at the beginning of the year, even before the beginning of the year, it'd be a, this is a good passage to start the year. Coming up next week, we have our annual church business meeting. Uh, but the, as I expressed last time, the, what you read about in Ephesians 4 and in, uh, in verses uh, 3, 4, 5, 6 there, about the unity of the Spirit is really the very statement of the purpose of Grace Bible Church, why we exist. And, uh, and you can see just in the reading that that is right out of Scripture, a, a doctrinal statement as well as a very purpose statement of the body of Christ. In fact, my reading, just to read on, is just to, so you can see the different expressions in just chapter 4 alone concerning the body of Christ and why we meet. And, and so anyhow, I thought the first of the year, this is, this is just good for us to go over and, and to be refreshed about. Now last week I actually did a little bit of e talking about Ephesians as a whole because uh, when you start Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. And, you know, he starts therefore, well, based on the things he's already taught. And the book of Ephesians takes us from the very understanding of, of God turning to us Gentiles in his grace and saving us to why. What is the purpose of it? What, what is this dispensation of grace is all about? And you begin to learn in Ephesians 3 about God's eternal purpose. Uh, that God had. You learn even in Ephesians chapter 1, talking about the dispensation of the fullness of times, what God has purposed to fulfill, bring all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in Him. So you begin, to, I always called it the capstone of information about the body of Christ, uh, about our purpose. And after he teaches doctrinally what the purpose of the body of Christ is, what, what Philippians would say is our high calling, he, then he breaks uh, into the practical in, verse, in chapter 4 because we talk about walk being the practical application of doctrine. So chapter 4 verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So we talked a lot about Ephesians so that you would see the importance of that. Let me just say this to you as well. 
Notice chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. And he's writing to us Gentiles in the age of grace. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. Uh, but if you look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. He's writing to us Gentile believers in the age of grace. And uh, he calls himself a prisoner for the Gentiles. And now in chapter 4, prisoner of the Lord, uh, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. Serving the Lord, taking the message of, that God has for us today in the age of grace to us Gentiles, caused Paul imprisonment. Uh, eventually it cost him his life. Uh, but he is the prisoner of the Lord, but he's also the prisoner for us Gentiles, and he beseeches us that we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. So we spent time talking about that word vocation, so you realize that a vocation is your calling, and you have a calling in life, and you might do other occupation, but the occupation that God gave you is to walk worthy of his calling of who you are in Christ what God has made you in Christ, and, and uh, the things that he's going to list in this passage, they're called our vocation. It's not a hobby, it's, it's our calling, it's our occupation, it's, it's our purpose as members of the body of Christ. Uh, so it's the vocation wherewith you are called, and we're to have the right spirit about it, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We also stress the word keep. The idea keep there is to guard and to protect and to show, to demonstrate what God has created, what God has done. Just like Adam and Eve in keeping the garden. They didn't make the garden. They didn't plant the garden. <laughs> they were to keep the garden. They were to guard it from anybody intruding. And Satan did intrude. And as a result, sin intruded. And as a result, thorns and thistles grew in that garden. But their job was to keep that garden. Display the beauty of what God has created for the world to see. And, uh, and Adam and Eve failed to guard that. Our job is God has created a unity in this age of grace. It's called the unity of the Spirit, because it's the Spirit of God who has created this unity, and our job is to guard it and to keep it. We've got to watch out for intruders who would come in and take away from this beauty that God created. Or, there's seven unities here, and that's the number of divine perfection. If someone tried to add something to God's divine perfection, they would distort it. They would pervert it. Our job is to guard it, to keep it, and, uh, and to make sure and to display it. Uh, that people see what the unity of the Spirit is in the bond of peace. So then it starts listing that unity. Uh, one, one word that I'd like to back up and, and talk about before we start talking about those unities again is that word endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Just in a plain Webster dictionary, when you say endeavor, you're talking about to exert oneself. So this isn't just something a laid back endeavor, this is something where there's an exertion to it, where you put the effort forward. It, it actually means to strive to achieve. And, and so it's a goal that we, we want to reach. It means to fulfill an obligation. <laughs> well, we have a calling. And to fulfill that obligation, we are, to, we are to endure to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It is to work with a set purpose. And God has told us what our purpose is, and now we're called to keep this unity, and we're to work for that purpose, to set forth that purpose. Interesting, the last definition in the Webster Dictionary is to finish the race. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Paul finished his course and kept the faith, he said. And, and certainly this is the faith. That's why I called it the body of truth uh, for us today. It is the, the biblical doctrinal statement of the body of Christ. So we, these seven unities that are found in verses 4 through 6 is what our vocation is all about and what we are to endeavor to keep. And as Grace Bible Church, this is what our church is founded on. So we started looking at it, and I took off last week, thought I was going to cover this in two, two studies you could actually, in the seven unities, do easily do one study in every one of those. Uh, but I was going to do it in two, and hopefully I'll do it in three now. But <laughs> I took off like a racehorse out of the chute, and, and by the time I got to the second, I'm already jumping, you know, skipping stuff in my notes to try to get down to the hope because I want to end with uh, talking about our hope. Uh, I squeezed it in at the end. I put it out on the church sign. Every year I try to talk about something about the rapture. 
we'll get, we're going to talk about that again because I went so fast. But la last week I ended by just giving you that little cliche that I wrote out for the year that the Bible says, I have not seen, but that may change in 2017. I said it so fast, you probably didn't even hear it last week. <laughs> well, my goal was to get to it. But anyhow, uh, I just went a little bit too fast. And even from the very beginning, there are some things I told Brandon this week that I was troubled when I went home because of trying to cover them. And I'm not going to try to cover them in, 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 in extreme detail. But uh, even though we covered the, the one body uh, pretty significantly last week, there was an application that I, I failed to make that I, I thought, I'm going to hit each one of these again and then move into verse 5. But we started out, there's three in verse four. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called into one hope of your calling. One of the things I did get accomplished, whether you caught it or not, is that all those three things said in verse four are associated with the spirit. Just as we'll see, there's three things mentioned in verse five and they're associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's three things said about God and the Father of us all. He's in all, uh, he's through all, uh, uh, no, he's above all, through all, and in you all. Uh, but so there, there are th everything that's in that verse, it's easy to see that, uh, like in verse 4, that the, the body and the hope are all centered around the Holy Spirit. Uh, certainly we started out talking about the body. It's by one spirit are we all, there's unity, baptized into one, there's unity, body. And the Holy Spirit has placed us into that one body. Now we'll talk more about that when we talk about the one baptism in, in, in verse 5. But the body of Christ, it was interesting that the very first unity that Paul would express, that, that we're to endeavor to keep, he starts out with the one body. And, uh, and certainly there is a, an importance of that understanding. As, as we mentioned, it's only in Paul's epistles that you read about the body of Christ. It's not found anywhere else. Because only we in the Bible are the body of Christ. God prior to us was forming a nation and he's going to make that into a holy nation that's the nation of Israel and through them reach the Gentiles during the millennial age but, but today God has now formed a, a new agency called the body of Christ and that's, that's essential to understand the dispensation of grace and to understand what God is doing today he's formed the body of Christ and every person who gets saved in this age of grace is baptized into that body of Christ and there's, we're all one in the body of Christ. Now that's emphasized, we, we were talking about that last time and, and I was emphasizing how Paul mentions that. It's only found in Paul's epistles, but he talks about it some 20 plus times in his epistles so that you'd realize who we are and yet the church, now that's the so-called church, uh, Christian Christianity, or Pastor Jordan likes to call it Christian dumb, uh, they, they have a hard time. They don't really know who we are. They, they don't recognize Paul in the age of grace and God doing something different. And they, a lot of times, most churches try to make us spiritual Israel. In case you have a problem with that, you know what spiritual Israel is? Out of Israel, the ones who got the Holy Spirit, that's spiritual Israel. There, there was a believing remnant in the nation of Israel. They received the Holy Spirit. That's spiritual Israel. We're not them. We are the body of Christ. That's the first essential to realize who we are, what God is doing today, and what we're to keep. That the very fact that, that we're one body. In Ephesians, it, it just says it over and over again. If you look over in Ephesians 1 and verse 22, it says, And God hath put, speaking of God the Father, hath put all things under his feet, under the feet of Jesus Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We fill up something that God wanted to fill with Jesus Christ. And the idea is you go through the book of Ephesians, you find out where everything about the body of Christ is centered in heavenly places. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And, and God wants to fill the heavens with the glory of Jesus Christ. He already declared to Israel he's going to fill the earth with his glory and that's going to be through the believing remnant of Israel and what God's accomplishment in Israel after the millennium is over but it's through the body of Christ but we are called it's said the church which is his body because there a church just means a call out assembly but we're not the called out of Israel to make up his nation we're the called out of Jew and Gentile alike to make up his body and and then to fill all all things in Ephesians 2, sometimes there's a discussion about this verse in verse uh, uh, 16. It says, and that he might reconcile both. Now that would be Jew and Gentile 
unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. And there, there could be an exp thinking there that the one body is talking about the personal body of Jesus Christ on the cross. But the reconciling of Jew and Gentile together is in the body of Christ. You always read that you're neither Jew nor Gentile, you're one in Jesus Christ. And I think the very context there is talking about the one body is that he's reconciling Jew and Gentile together in the body of Christ today. And, and that's important to me because there's an expression made in chapter 3. If you look at chapter 3 in verse 6, after Paul, and by the way, I, you should memorize chapter 3 verses 1 through 11. Uh, we, we refer to it quite often, but you ought to have that memorized. In the beginning of a year, not only should you be reading your Bible through, whether you finish it one year or not, you ought to be in the scriptures reading the scriptures, but challenge yourself, I challenge you, to memorize Ephesians 3 verses 1 through 11. You'll understand real clearly what the age of grace is all about and, and that we live in this dispensation of grace. But after Paul says about it, that it's not been made known in other ages, he says in verse 6, he kind of gives it a definition, he says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with who? Well, we're, we're heirs in Christ, but Jew and Gentile together receiving an inheritance. And that inheritance is chapter 1, verse 11. It's going to be those heavenly places. And of the same body. The same with who? Same with Israel. That's, to me, when I, when I read that same body, I, I take people back to chapter 2 and verse 16, where reconciled Jew and Gentile reconciled together in one body, the body of Christ, which is mentioned in chapter 1. So anyhow, of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ uh, by the gospel. Jew or Gentile today can be saved by the gospel message. And we're partakers uh, of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So anyhow, you have the body again in chapter, six, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. And then in chapter 4, not only you have the one body in verse 4, but in our scripture reading, there's a couple reasons I read as much as I did. One of the other things I want you to see is that when he gave God, Jesus Christ, when he ascended up on high, that last part of verse 9, that he ascended up far above all heavens. That means he's above the principalities of power. He just, didn't get, he just was not exalted into heaven. He was exalted above all heavens. So that he's above all the principalities and powers. That's the governmental structure in heaven. And he's that way because we're going to fill those places. But, but then it says that he gave from that position... For the body of Christ's sake, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So he gave for, the, for that purpose, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You see the body of Christ mentioned there. And then when he talks about, uh, in verse 16, from whom the whole body, that is, from, from Jesus Christ, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. <laughs> we're we're kind of squeezed tight in the body of Christ. <laughs> that which every joint supplieth. Now that's an important part of what, the application I want to make that I think I left out last week. That we're put in the body of Christ and we're closely connected in Jesus Christ. All believers. We're compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working. God is working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. If you get anything, you realize the body of Christ must be an important thing here. And one of, part of that importance is there is there's supposed to be an edific, edification of the body of Christ, began by those gifts, but continue by, by God working in every member of the body of Christ to the edifying of itself in love. That love is back in verse uh, 15, speaking the truth in, in, in love. We love one another to express the truth to each other so that the whole body of Christ can grow together. So there's an emphasis about the body of Christ in the book of Ephesians. There is again in Colossians, but uh, just to kind of fill out one more thing, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, and look at verse 28. No, it's verse, 20, uh, verse 30. Verse 30. It says, chapter 5, verse 30, says, We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Verse, uh, verse uh, 32, For this is a great mystery, but I seek, speak concerning Christ and the church. We're the church that's a member, we're members of the body of Christ. And, uh, and that's an important doctrine for us to know who we are and how God has put us together 
who we are in this age of grace. The identification is that we're the body of Christ. Now, hold your place in Ephesians and come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I read a good section of this last time, but I don't think I read these verses. I wanted to make sure you've seen these verses because this is, this, is, this is the thing I got thinking about. I stressed the fact who we are. Uh, I think I stressed enough about us being knit together even last time. But notice in chapter 12 in, of 1 Corinthians and in verse 18, it says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. That's 1 Corinthians 12, if I got you in the wrong place, verse 18. God has set us in the body as it has pleased him. There is an effectual working in the body of Christ. You, there is a ministry you have as a member of the body of Christ. And you've been placed in the body of Christ, in the illustration above that, you know, there's an eye and there's a hand, there's a foot and all of those things. And that's just to illustrate that we're the body of Christ and, and you know, the eye can't say to the ear, I have no need of you. <laughs> we, need a, we, we, all, we need each other. We have, we have, there's, I, I kept saying last time that it, the body of Christ is first unique to the age of grace. It is, it is diverse and yet unified, and we saw that in these verses, and then we saw in Ephesians that it's important for growth. But again, let me, verse 18 says, Now God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where, would, where, where were the body? But now are they, they many members, yet but one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to, be, to seem more feeble are necessary. And those members which, of the body which we think be less honorable, upon these we bestow the more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have the more abundant comeliness. There's parts of your body that are ugly, but boy, they're necessary, aren't they? I mean, feet don't impress me too much. And they, you know, they had to wash feet in Bible days because they smelled a little bit too. But where would you be without it? <laughs> without them. <laughs> you need your feet. You need the different parts of the body. I say that to you because I want to remind you that you're placed in the body of Christ as God pleased God. You're knit together with other members of the body of Christ for the growth and edification of the body of Christ. And if you think you're one of those unnecessary members, and I do believe there's a lot of people, oh, I'm, just, I'm just a nobody. No, look at those verses again. You're needed. You're honored. You're necessary. That's not, that's not a light thing to think about. You're a member of the body of Christ, and you have a part in the body of Christ. Now, I don't know exactly how each one functions or even how they function together, but God will use you and your personality as you allow him to, unless you just want to live for the world. But if you want to live for the Lord, God will use you, and you're a necessary part of the body of Christ. Don't think, well, I'm not a necessary part. I'll let them do the work of the ministry, and I'll go off and do something else. Read those verses and realize you're a necessary part of the body of Christ, an important part of the body of Christ. And, uh, and, and your absence of working with the body of Christ is actually a, a detriment to the body of Christ. So Paul starts out, the first unity is that we're one body. Then, then he says that we're, there, there is one body and then there's one spirit. Uh, and we talked about the work of the Holy Spirit, but that's where I began to go pretty fast last time. And, uh, but one thing that I, I did stress is that everything was associated with the Holy Spirit in this passage. But in the list of things, there are so many things. We actually live in the day in which God the Father spoke through the prophets in, in the Old Testament. Then Jesus Christ him came, himself came to the nation of Israel, ministered in the land of Israel. Then Jesus Christ left, and, and first the Holy Spirit came upon the believing remnant of Israel for the continued ministry to Israel. And when God cut off the nation of Israel, he gave us Gentiles the Holy Spirit that was promised them. It's Romans 15 says, we, we've been made partakers of their spiritual things. 
And, and what we have by the grace of God, not by the covenant of God, but by the grace of God, we have the Holy Spirit. That every believer, when you go to Corinthians, you find out both are true. Every individual believer, his body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That the Holy Spirit indwells you when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know, you got the comics or even the people, they understand a biblical expression, they don't understand what it means, but they'll make the, you know, a guy be working out in a gym and he'll say, yeah, my body's a temple. They don't realize they're quoting scripture. That, that guy, his body may be his own temple, <laughs> but we who are believers, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God dwells in us. And yet at the same time, Paul will say that he dwells in ye, the group, the body of Christ. Because if he dwells in every individual member of the body of Christ, he dwells in us collectively as well. But so this, is the, this day and age in which we live today is the day and age in which the Holy Spirit of God is working today. And, and he first indwells us, then you find out he leads us. Uh, we're taught by him in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, it says. And then... Uh, uh, we're to walk, learn to walk in the Spirit. Um, we're empowered by the Spirit. I'm going to show a couple of these that are in Ephesians. We're empowered by the Spirit of God today. We're to keep that unity of the Spirit. We're to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, I did mention the fact that we're not to quench the Spirit. Ephesians talks about not grieving the Spirit. In fact, the ones that are in Ephesians, come, over, come back to chapter 1. I don't even know if I just mentioned this one. There is a... Well, when I get to 4, I'll tell you. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, that is in Jesus Christ, after that ye heard the, the, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, unto the redemption of the purchased possession, till God takes what he has paid for to, unto himself, unto the praise of his glory. So in verse 13, you realize one of the things the Holy Spirit does is not only does he place us in the one body of Christ, and not only does he indwell us, but then when he comes in, he seals us unto the day of redemption. Sealed as God's ownership. We belong to the Lord. And he seals us all the way until the day of redemption, and that's going to bring about the praise of God's glory. So we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Not only are we, we sealed by the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 and verse 22, it says, In whom ye are builded together, that's in, in, in the Lord, we are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God inhabits us. We might be placed in Christ, but he inhabits us, and that's through the Spirit that he inhabits us. Now, if chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, that, that he, this is Paul's prayer, that he, God, would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. God's not working on the outer man. This is what I wanted to express to you. Part of the reason of what I read in chapter 4 is there's an understanding here that, you know, the, the people who study like the Holy Spirit, realizing this is the age in which God is working through his spirit today, want to do the things that the Holy Spirit did externally, not only to the nation of Israel, but early in the body of Christ. When, when, when there was gifts given to men, there were gifts of healing when it first came. All those miraculous sign gifts that were given, were given by the Spirit of God, you'll eventually see, for the purpose of giving us the Word of God. And the, I, I just want to express it to you this way. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 11, when Jesus Christ ascended on high and he gave gifts to the body of Christ, it says in verse 11, and he gave. That's past tense. When did he do that? When he ascended up on high. When God the Father exalted Jesus Christ far above all heavens, Jesus Christ gave these gifts to members of the body of Christ. Gave, that's past tense, back then. He gave it for the reason of verse 12. But verse 13 says, till we come to the unity of the faith. So we have one body of truth to believe. Now we'll talk about that when we get to the one faith. But notice you got, he gave, past tense, till in verse 13. Verse 14 says that henceforth we be no more children. So he's accomplished what he gave those gifts for. And, and then now we have the body of Christ edifying of itself in love. So the miraculous things of the Holy Spirit, the external work of the Holy Spirit, that's ended. 
But my point to you in verse chapter 3 and verse 16, that God would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's where God's working today. In your inner man, inside of you, the spirit of God taking the truth of God and empowering your life. Colossians says with all might to be able to go through anything that you need to go through in this life. And there's many things you need to go through in this life, but God's working in you to that, uh, with, by His might, by His Spirit, in that inner man. And, and so you have in the book of Ephesians uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Um, chapter 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I think we talked enough about that. To be under the control of the Holy Spirit. So God, in these unities that have been given to us, there's one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Now this is where we really didn't cover too much about, but it's an important thing. There is one hope of our calling. I want you to understand that when you talk about our hope, the word hope by itself there's a sense in which, when, when, in, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, he stands up and he says, for the hope of Israel am I in these bonds. And people get a wrong understanding about that. They think that Paul is arrested because he's preaching Israel's kingdom message. But if you go back in Acts, you find out that when Paul was first arrested, he saw Pharisees and Sadducees gathered together, and he starts talking about the resurrection and the belief in the resurrection. And it made the Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection, have a fight. And Rome arrested Paul because he believed in the resurrection. Now what, I, what I'm trying to say to you is the most basic part about hope, hope is centered about resurrection. That God is actually going to raise our bodies from the dead someday. But that's not all what our hope is all about or, or about. Come back with me to Romans chapter 8. Now we talked about the Spirit helping us. <laughs> this is this chapter is all about the Spirit and the fact that we are going to suffer. Chapter 8, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. So we're, looking, we're not looking for hope now. And this, this is an important part. If there's one hope, and say you get cancer. We talked in Sunday school, those that are suffering cancer. Uh, family members of people here suffering cancer. And there's other ailments as well. But your hope isn't, you, you might hope in, the, in just the wishful thinking that the doctors will treat the cancer and will go in remission. You hope it will go away. But when it says there's one hope, the hope isn't for cancer to be taken away from you. The hope isn't for your body to be healed. The hope is resurrection. And, and we have one hope. And that's important because you can wish that those others will take place. But the hope, hope in your Bible means a joyful anticipation of what God has promised. And, and what he has promised is there's going to be a glory revealed in us. If you drop down to verse uh, 24, it says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is, is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But, what, but if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. So hope, when it says we are saved by hope, that saved by hope, the hope that we have, the hope of glory that we have, of resurrected and glorified bodies, will save you from despair and discouragement and disappointment and anxiety when you go through the troubles of this life. In fact, it says that not only are we going to suffer, verse 23 says, and not only they, the world, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, see how the Spirit's associated with the hope? Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So we're talking about here the redemption of our body. Our souls have been redeemed already by the cross of Christ. We already belong to Him. He's paid the price. But now we're waiting for the redemption of our body. How long are we sealed with the Holy Spirit? Until the day of redemption. <laughs> and we're gonna, our bodies are going to be redeemed from the ground. He's going to take until the 
the redemption of the purchased possession. We've been purchased, and Jesus Christ is going to come back and take possession of us. And that's, that's connected with the hope. So the hope is resurrection, but it's also a day of redemption in which we're going to be raised from the dead. And we as members of the body of Christ, we have one hope. We're all going to go together. Come over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. See, there's one hope for the members of the body of Christ, whether you're dead or alive when Jesus Christ comes. You're all going to experience the same hope at the same time. There's only one hope for the body of Christ. And it's when Jesus Christ comes. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 talks about Jesus Christ, our hope. <laughs> so it has to do with the coming of Christ, and, and it's the hope of whether we... The reason we don't sorrow as others who have no hope is lost people don't have a hope. In fact, Ephesians 2 reminds us there was times us Gentiles were without hope. But now in Christ Jesus, you are, uh, um, in Christ Jesus, uh, anyhow, we have hope. <laughs> We're uh, getting worse and worse. <laughs> uh, anyhow, so the, the idea, of whether you sleep or awake, there's the same hope, and you don't have to sorrow for someone who's died, because they're going to experience the same hope when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Verse 15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort, comfort one another with these words. That's the hope we have. And it'll save us from despair and discouragement and hurt, even with the death of a loved one. Remembering that we all have the same hope. And the, the sufferings we suffer are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. And that's going to take place on the day of redemption, when Jesus Christ comes back, and the dead are going to be rised, raised, and we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now that's, that's interesting because the hope then is not just resurrection. The hope is the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. It's the day of redemption. And some people say, well, you know, the timing of the rapture. And by the way, when we say rapture, that's not a biblical term. Notice again it says, verse 16, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ uh, shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That, those, that expression of caught up means rapture. And, and, and it, it actually goes to a Latin word, but that's how we ended up calling this event the rapture. It's, biblically, it's the catching up. Now that's important. I told you if you study the book of Ephesians, you find out God's purpose for the body of Christ. The purpose of the body of Christ is heavenly places. There's no other place in the Bible that believers are going to be resurrected and caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds there. There's no other place in the Bible where that's talked about. Because it's only the body of Christ who gets caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Peter and them, they're, they're, they're praying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. They're looking for Jesus Christ to come back and his feet to stand on the Mount of Olives, not stand in the clouds somewhere and then be caught up, but him to be stand on the Mount of Olives, come down into Jerusalem, and there's going to be a called the first resurrection that's going to take place where people are going to reign with him on earth a thousand years. That's Israel's purpose. This is a unique calling to the body of Christ. The Re uh, reason I'm expressing that is there are some people would say that this rapture, this catching up, isn't necessarily the hope. The hope is just resurrection. The timing of the hope is not necessarily part of it. I think it is necessarily part of it. That you're going to be resurrected, 
when the Lord comes, it's called the day of redemption, and when that takes place, we're going to be caught up. That, that's, that's all part of our hope. That's part of the, the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And the very fact that that rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. You know, when you study, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Just taking that middle one, why the voice of the archangel? Just study archangel in your Bible. Every time you read about the archangel, he's fighting Satan. Satan has not been cast out of the earth yet. We're going to be raptured up, go right through the domain of Satan into the third heavens. Stand at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to take place there. In the middle of tribulation, Satan and his angels are going to be cast down to the earth, and it says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. But when we get raptured out, Satan hasn't been cast out yet. This is a pre-tribulational rapture. Before God commences his program with Israel, we're going to be taken out of this earth, into the heavens. Why in the heavens? Because that's the purpose of the body of Christ. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you can't put these pieces together. There is a great abandonment going on now about the rapture. There are people leaving the idea that there's a pre-trib rapture. Even if they hang on to a rapture, they believe that right before Jesus Christ does his final destruction on the earth, people get raptured out, destroys, and then they come back. So they got it at the end of the tribulation, if not after the tribulation. But, but that's because they don't know we're the body of Christ and we're not the nation of Israel that we have a whole different calling than the body of Christ has. And Paul's, that's why he's saying this, that there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called into one hope of your calling. I demonstrated last week, the one thing I did demonstrate, is that the Holy Spirit starts out the age of grace in sanctifying the Gentiles. And when you read about the rapture in 2 Thessalonians 2, it talks about being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That is, taken out of the earth by the Holy Spirit uh, uh, when the rapture takes place. Uh, not taking it back from Second Thessalonians, look at chapter 5 here. He go, he's going to go to talk about the day of the Lord. And he says in chapter 5, verse 5, Ye are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Now the tribulation is a day of darkness. We're not of that. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunken are drunken in the night. That's the people going through the tribulation. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. See, we're going to be raptured out. And we're not going to be part of that day of the Lord. And we're to put on that helmet for a, the, our hope of salvation. Look, look, since you're right here, just a couple books over to uh, Titus chapter 2. It says in verse 12, I'll start in verse 11. It says in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I always think about the way, how did grace appear to all men? Well, when Israel committed the unpardonable sin, and it was time for the sun to be darkened and the moon turned to blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come, did the world ever see that? You know what they saw? Even if they didn't understand what they were seeing, you know what they saw? The sun come out the next day. Peace offered by God, reconciliation to all men, no wrath, God not holding anybody's sins against them. Whether they saw it and recognized what's happening, there came a time for God's wrath to be poured out on this earth, but it never came. And the world has experienced for the last 2,000 years this grace of God that's been appearing to all men. They just don't know what's happening. They, don't, they, they, they think that God will never judge. But he came close to judging, but he interrupted it with the age of grace. So the, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. Now that's the believer. It's all men. It's available to all men, and it's God's being gracious to all men. But us who are saved, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. We who are saved, we're to deny ungodliness and worldly loss. We're to live soberly. Not, not just not intoxicated with alcohol, but not intoxicated with the, the thoughts and the thinking of this world. We can think soberly because of God's word. And we, can, uh, we are to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And as we're doing that, notice grace hath appeared, that's past. Teaching is present. And here's the future in verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're waiting for him to appear. And he's going to appear and we're going to be caught up to be with him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in the heavenly places. That's the one hope we have. And that understanding of that one hope and the glory that's going to be revealed in us then, seen visibly, physically, it's in us now, but seen physically then, will help you through all the difficulties in this life. If you endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there's one body, one Spirit, even as you're called into one hope of your calling. And if by chance you're not saved, God's grace is all around you. The very fact that you live and move and have your being and have not been damned, God's grace is being extended to you. Jesus Christ is called the great God and our Savior. Verse 14 told you why he, how he became our Savior, who gave himself for us. Speaking about his death, burial, and resurrection, he died for our sins. That he might redeem us, pay the price of our sin, free us from the bondage of sin, redeem us from all iniquity. And he did that. He paid for all of our sin to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good work. And he has purified unto himself a zealous people. That is, he's put his Holy Spirit within us. We are accepted in the Beloved. We're given everlasting life, sealed unto the day of redemption. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need not to uh, quit ignoring the grace of God but realize the grace of God and what's being extended to you and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you that we could review those same things that we looked at last week and perhaps make them a little bit more practical, see the importance of us endeavoring to keep this unity that your Spirit has created, to know what it is so that we can guard it from someone who will tell us that it's something else when it's not. And, uh, and rejoice in it and be empowered by it. And may others even see it as we express it to them and live it as a local body of believers. So help us to come back together and continue to study these unities next week and perhaps the week after. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Let's stand and sing the wonderful chorus, Jesus Paid It All. It's number 77 in your hymnal if you need it. dismissed.